Ajit Damani, I'm an associate professor in the CS department. I'm in charge of uh, CSA 5100 and 6100. So the syllabus is already online. As you know, attendance is mandatory. On this, you send me an email. There are some you know, situations in which we coordinate with course manager Daniel, which he didn't help after I'm done. So uh, it's mandatory to attend the colloquium. And you have one week to comply and you know answer the assignment. Uh, you can miss up to 10% of the colloquium without any penalty. And uh, you can also submit your assignment all the way till the end of the semester. Of course, if you miss the deadline, which is one week after the colloquium, we will only get 25. I'm not a PowerPoint person. Uh, and so regarding the attendance, Daniel has a card reader. So maybe I introduce Daniel. So, and then Daniel will, will explain how the coordination works. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel. I'm a support manager for this board. Uh, you can just let us come at the end of the talk card. Uh, either before or after the talk, we will one five. And after the talk is over, I will leave the assignment for what you guys to do. And it's due a week after, so we like you like next Thursday at 15 months. So, yeah, any anything else for another week left? So, thank you. Oh, okay. great. Yeah, I think you have to do like two screens or something. Does anybody know how to turn off the presenter mode on PowerPoint? Uh, turn it off. Yeah, turn it off. Right click. There's no right click. Like start your start your talk. Or you can do set up slides. Yeah, start your talk. And then right click on your slide. Yeah. It's over here. I can't. Yeah, exactly. Okay, here. Now what? Oh, yeah, sorry. The top right? Oh, but then, yeah. So then, whatever. The, the Zoom people will see. The Zoom people aren't seeing anything. Oh, my God. You know, Phil, chat about that. Yeah, Zoom sees a weird thing. Well, do you see how it's like backwards on Zoom? I do. Yeah. Uh, where is the age old question of how many PhDs does it take to fix the problem? All of them. We need one more. Oh, nice. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Aaron Cloud. I'm a professor here at the Department of Computer Science and Faculty in Biofrontiers. I'm the host for today's presentation. Um, Dr. Ryan Layer is going to be our speaker today. Um, he received both a bachelor's degree and master's degree in computer science from Texas A&M University and then completed his doctoral training in computer science at the University of Virginia. He then spent four years doing postdoctoral work, first at UVA and then at the University of Utah, working under Aaron Quinlan. In 2018, he joined us here at CU as an assistant professor in computer science and was core faculty in the Biofrontiers Institute. Ryan's research focuses on developing powerful new and useful algorithms for exploring and integrating the vast quantities of data that are produced by modern large scale genomics projects. In order to understand the interplay between genetic variation, gene regulation, and disease, with a particular emphasis on new efforts to understand structural variants in the human genome. Please join me in welcoming our very own Ryan Layer. Yeah, so as Aaron said, my research is in computational biology. The specific area is computational genomics. So it's the overlap of large scale genetics and computer science. So there's a, a really sweet spot in most uh, interdisciplinary research with computer science where if you understand the details of the science and, and the details of algorithms and data structures, you can make some pretty amazing advancements. Uh, so we do a lot of things in the lab, uh, but I'm gonna particularly talk about just one project. So Kristen is a hopefully soon to graduate CS PhD student. She's also IQ Biology and this is her main project. Uh, and the, the reason we went after this started with, because we like to make hard problems run really, really fast. Um, and it morphed into a, a bigger project where we think that we have some technology that can really address some system.
systematic deficiencies in our healthcare systems, in particular, make healthcare work for people who are underrepresented in many clinical trials. Uh, so when, you know, why is that important? Well, you go to a doctor, the doctor is going to treat you based on their own experiences, your own values, and data. The data that they rely the most on is clinical trials. So what does that look like for, for a doctor? So this is a, a blood pressure medication. And so a clinical trial to the doctor is just a giant PDF with a ton of adverse uh, effects, but also the real money uh, piece of this is one table. This is the table in which they will do the initial dosage based on a couple of biomarkers. So you might say, you come in, they say, okay, five milligrams, start there. But there's also this little piece here that's, that can be titrated up. That means like increased to up to 40 milligrams per day or until you respond or 40 milligrams. So that range from five to 40, especially in medications like, like blood pressure or any sort of like uh, schizophrenia medication or, or lots of others can be super painful. We probably all have personally experienced or know somebody who's personally experienced the struggle with finding the right medication and the right dosage. So what is going on here? Well, we think it's there's important differences between you and who was in that clinical trial. So clinical trial says, how does a medication respond on average in the population? What you want to know is what medication works best for you. And those are two different questions. And it's a really huge problem if the people in the trial, the average person in the trial looks nothing like you. And this is not something that I'm just observing. It's a major problem that has had major investment in, uh, in the United States. The National Academy of Sciences studied this a couple of years ago, and they came up with the basic conclusion that large swaths of people, especially those who are most at risk in our health system, don't benefit from a lot of our advances because they are not represented in the clinical research cohorts. Um, other groups have quantified this effect. So let me explain the graph here. So the y-axis is this accuracy of what we call a polygenic risk score. That is, think of 23andMe, you get your genetics, you get a score for how likely are you to have dementia or heart disease. All right, if, if they say you are unlikely to have heart disease, but you end up with heart disease, that's a low accuracy score, right? So that's what the, the y-axis is the accuracy of those risk scores. Uh, the x-axis is the genetic distance between an individual and the reference cohort. So not surprisingly, you see an underrepresentation of particular groups that lead to inaccurate healthcare or inaccurate uh, risk scores. Not a big surprise, but it's a, that's a pretty stark quanta, uh, quantification of that effect. So what's the solution? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah. More data? Well, I mean, we have a lot of data, but with this data, so why don't we just split this up into, in this case, uh, genetic ancestry specific cohorts, right? We can have a European cohort, we can have an African cohort, and that might work well for some people, but the world's a very diverse place. For other people, they would actually be better served by a mixture of distribution of, of populations. So there's not a really clean line in which we can draw among these ancestries to ensure that every individual is properly uh, represented. So our solution is to flip this entire, uh, this entire paradigm of having static clinical trials. What we would like is we'd like a patient comes into the doctor, that doctor has a device on them and they can say, they can click a button and says, run a trial. So they run that trial and what we can do is we can use these massive biobanks that we're, that we're collecting. Uh, CU Anschutz has a biobank with 200,000 people in it. We've sequenced about 100,000 of them. So there's a lot of data in there. That is genetics matched with electronic health records. So what we'd like to do is among this giant population, why don't we find all the people, this is pretty slow, uh, uh, all the people that look like our patient and then let's do the math on just those individuals and then send those results in real time back to the doctor that says, okay, five milligrams might be the, the standard dosage that the clinical trial said, but people that look like you, they did better at 7.5. And we also have the electronic medical records at that point where we can actually inform the doctor about how well represented that patient is in that cohort. So they can use the five milligram, which is a safe, well-tested well dosage, compared with potentially an increased one, well, okay, 
this cohort looks just like you. So I think let's try Let's start at 7.5. And hopefully with this kind of information, you now have the question that we want. What is the best medication for you or for people that look just like you? All right. So that sounds pretty good. Um, and so what is the challenge in this scenario? Well, the challenge is not going back and reanalyzing patient data. This is a, a very common meta-analysis, retrospective clinical trial. We go back and look at electronic health records all the time to see how well um, different populations did. The, the thing that is difficult here is actually trying to figure out in a very fast and dynamic way, who is more similar to my patient and who is less similar to my patient. And that's the real challenge that we're trying to address. So we talk about similarity here. I'm talking just about genetic similarity. And I will fully acknowledge that genetic similarity and genetic distances are not always the best representation of what who looks just like you. You know, the, the idea of similar patients is dynamic and it probably changes over time. If I start smoking, the people who best represent me as a patient will switch very quickly. Um, if, if I'm diagnosed with, with uh, diabetes, it will then switch again. So it's, it's really patient specific. But genetics are stable, and we understand them, kind of. And so we're going to start with genetic similarity because it's better than we're doing right now. Okay. Make sense? All right, so what is genetic similarity? To get into that, talk a little bit about genetics here. Human genome has, or all of us have, have 24 different chromosomes. Well, not all of us. Uh, there are 24 different human chromosomes. Uh, and you get one copy from mom and one copy from dad. So we're we're diploid. We have two, every chromosome, we have we have a pair of them. Um, this is a male configuration. This is a female configuration. Uh, we have this, I might refer to this word haplotype and it's a terrible word. It refers to when you have two chromosomes, I'm referring to just one of them. Uh, it's a mashup of two words. Haploid are, are organisms that have just one copy of every chromosome and your genotype is your specific genetic makeup. We took those two words, we smashed them together. And this is how we refer to just one of your chromosomes, um, in, in, in the case that you have two. But to say that we get one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad really skips over a really important piece of, of genetic variation in our population that happens in meiosis. So meiosis is a specific type of cell division that leads to gametes. Those are sperm and egg. So the process is they first, each of those pairs, uh, they duplicate, they move to either ends of the cell. You probably are having some flashbacks to high school drawings of, of spindles. At this point, there's a, a really interesting event called recombination where they actually swap genetic material between those chromosomes. So we now have these mosaics of, uh, of your parents' chromosomes lead to the formation of your gametes. Uh, so these are your gametes and then you lead to fertilization. So you have two gametes that fuse. And while the genetic material from this new, newly developed organism is directly from their, their parents, it's a, they are totally new, never seen before chromosomes. So you can imagine how this really improves the diversity, the genetic diversity in the population. Uh, but it actually makes tracking genetic similarity uh, a little bit more difficult, especially if you look at how recombination affects genetic distance over time. So we have two parents, you know, and, and over time that recombination is happening at every generation. And you can see how you have these large blocks of sequence that every generation, the amount of sharing between individuals gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we actually have a name for this. It's called identity by descent. So these, these blocks, so that block and that block are from a common ancestor. They're identical by descent. And the best way of measuring the genetic distance between two individuals is the length of that block. So over time, that block's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and you become more distantly related to your, to your ancestors and to other people in your, in your generation and, and so on. Now there's, this is a random, mostly random process, which leads to some pretty weird effects. So Kristen spent a month in Iceland working with Decode, which is an Icelandic genetic company. It's now a, now bought, a, bought by Amgen, which is a giant pharmaceutical company, but they've sequenced most of the people, most of the, most of the Icelanders. And they also know all of their uh, genetic or their, their ancestry. So they match family tree with genetics. And we went through and, and Kristen calculated the amount of sharing between, you know, one meiosis is parent-child, two meiosis is like grandparent and so forth. And you can see that there's this really strange overlap. So even this idea that we think we understand genetic distance at a parent-child, grandparent, cousin level, when you actually look at the genetics, 
it's very messy. You have these overlapping and sometimes very contradictory results of cousins being being more similar genetic than than siblings. Uh, but that's it's it's just uh, you know as how the random process works. Uh, but as you might imagine, we have lots of ways of measuring genetic distance. And so why are we going about trying to get yet another one? Well, the, the problem with all of these methods is they are not built to scale to very large data sets. In particular, they find the genetic distance between pairs of individuals. So in this case, what you need to do is you need to take your entire population and do a full cross, ending, ending up with some giant matrix where every cell gives the distance between any two people. Well, what the hell do you do when you have a new person? Do you have to recalculate the whole thing? So this idea does not scale and, and would not be usable in a clinical setting. All right, so this is where we step in. So what do we do? We actually leverage a lot of the advances in, in searching using machine learning, in particular similarity search, which got a big boost with image similarity. You can you probably see the, the parallels between genetics. You have a lot of different individuals that have some similarity. You would like to put them all into a database you find a new individual who's not identical to anybody in there, but we're going to find, for example, their nearest neighbors. The trick here is all we need to do is figure out how to have an embedding or some sort of high dimensional numeric representation for every object. Once we can get that embedding, then we can use performance vector search database to serve as the uh, that that function that finds all the purple people. All right, so. What do we do here? Well, we, we're not going to just take a picture, take embeddings built for images and, and just some sort of take a picture of a chromosome or do some hack version like that uh, because there are fundamental differences between images and chromosomes. And even one that's the most simple is the idea of distance. So distance in a image is like by pixels. So 100 pixels is 100 pixels anywhere in that image. The fundamental unit we use for inheritance is called a centimorgan. A centromorgan is a stretch of DNA that is likely to be inherited uh, all at once. So recombination is unlikely to occur within one centromorgan. And we actually find this out experimentally. And we find out there's hotspots in the genome. So one centromorgan can be you know, 10,000 uh, nucleotides long. Another one can be a million nucleotides long. So there's not a consistent set of distance uh, in the genome with respect to inheritance. So we wanna make a new embedding model that is based on centimorgans. And so what we do is we just, we, we take the, the, an individual's chromosome, we break it up into centimorgans, and we actually compare the reference genome to that sample, okay? And we identify all those locations in which the sample is different than the reference. We call this a variant. Now a variant, so the reference genome, don't think of that as a healthy person, it's just, a bunch of people that took together and looked for consensus sequence. So this is, the reference genome is not healthy uh, and a variant is not necessarily bad, it just means that you're different. So we find all of those differences, we create a binary vector, uh, and then actually to do another level of compression, because that binary vector is gonna be three billion uh, um, bits long, we actually do a um, positional encoding of the variant locations for every individual. Uh, and we use a Siamese training uh, to learn and embedding from those first encodings. And so this is a really powerful method that can lead, can help you with whatever, whatever data type that you're using. If you have some initial idea how to calculate distance between two elements, you can use that to, to learn an effective, effective embedding. So Siamese network, you take a pair of embeddings or a pair of encodings, you know their distance, in this case, you put in distance. We send them through identical networks and we get embeddings for those two. We then compare the distance between those two embeddings and we use that as the loss function between the in initial distance and the embedding distance. And we just keep going, we just keep going until we get a uh, embeddings that correlate with the original distances. Make sense? So it's, it's basically a giant compression. You go from so you know billions or or hundreds of thousands of uh, of entries for these encodings to embeddings that have just you know, for example, you know, 256 uh, floats in them. All right, so this is our, our basic training model. Uh, and what does that look like? Well, it's, it's a little complex because like I said, we take the entire genome and we break it up by centimorgan. Well, there's about 3000 centimorgans in the human genome. Uh, this is just chromosome 18, there's a couple thousand. And we submit a query for every single, um, every single uh, centimorgan. So the result is this complex space. So this is one query 
and the results from one query. So for every centimorgan, you have your nearest neighbors for that centimorgan. And so the, the point of this is just to show that there is a lot of variability in the genome. You can actually see the big gaps are because the size of a centimorgan, you know, the, the x-axis is by nucleotide, but, uh, but we have this big gap because this centimorgan is very, very large. So, so the, the coverage is, is strange. The amount of variability within each one is strange. The y-axis is the, is the similarity. Um, and similarity is actually uh, a strange term here because it's actually difference. So lower is more similar and higher is less similar, which is a little bit backwards. So we have to take this complex result and we have to aggregate that down to, well, of all of these centimorgan-based results, who is the most similar? And we've tried a lot of different aggregation techniques. Turns out the very simplest one works. We just do a vote. Who occurs most often in this set is the most similar. The next is the, is the next most similar. We, we refer to that as our, as our score. And so you can see that here. Uh, and the interesting thing is you see this the, the most related individual also has this big block here. So that's an IBD, that's an identical by descent region where our query individual shares some common ancestor just at that location with that individual. Okay, so this is just one chromosome. We do this for all autosomes. So we don't mess with the X and the Y yet. We need to, we're not, we're not doing that yet. That's very complicated. Um, but we, we submit this query, we get nearest neighbor results for all centimorgans, and then we aggregate all of those together, basically counting how often an individual appeared in these results, and that's their score. The one with the highest score is the most related individual. Okay? All right, so how, do, how well does it work? Uh, well, first let's look at how well calibrated the genus's score is. So I showed you before uh, decode is sort of the world leader in, in, in like family genetics, closely related individuals. They sequence so many of them. Uh, and their, their method for IBD is, is one of the best. Well, you can see how our genus score closely captures the relationships uh, that were found also by DECODE's IBD. So I think the, this is good evidence that our score is well calibrated. However, we're, we don't really wanna find, it's not hard to find your relatives, right? And, and in fact, if you're going to be a patient and you go into the hospital, your relatives are probably not going to be in the hospital database. It's gonna be a bunch of strangers. So we actually need to look at how does this system react for a database of more distantly related individuals. And for this, we used a project called Thousand Genomes. Uh, I, I actually, used, don't, don't look at the numbers in there. How many genomes do you think Thousand Genomes collected? <laughs> Obviously, 3,202. Uh, and so what they did is they, they wanted to get a sense of the genetic diversity of the human race. And so they did sampling. They did very, very specific sampling in very specific regions of the of, uh, of the world. And, and they asked the question, basically, are both of your grandparents from your same spot? If yes, then you could be included. So it's, it's trying to get this regional diversity because the assumption is that the people who are close to you regionally will also be close to you uh, genetically. Now that doesn't make sense because we're all moving around, but these are individuals that haven't moved around in a long time. Uh, you can also see some big gaps. This is a pretty weird way of sampling the continent of Africa. Uh, also, uh, Native American tribes chose not to participate in the study. Not surprisingly, they've been incredibly mistreated by the genetics community for generations. Uh, so, but this does help us when we're trying to find, if we want to say if, if these two individuals are genetically similar, I don't really have a good way of knowing that. But what I can know is if you're from the same region, if you're from each of these is a subpopulation, the colors are called superpopulations. Uh, if you're from the same subpopulation, then you're very likely to be more genetically related than if you're from a different subpopulation. So we're going to rely on that fact. And there's actually good evidence here. These are the first two principal components of, of the genetics of all these individuals. And you can see subpopulations, superpopulations cluster very nicely. So I think at least with this sampling, the assumption holds that two people from the same subpopulation are going to be more genetically similar than two people from different subpopulations. Now, that's not always true. You have uh, in the Americas, you have the admixture of the indigenous plus Europeans. Uh, we also have of uh, American, uh, African Americans in this, uh, which which have a more complex genetic history. But we'll see that bear out in the data. Okay, everyone understand. So this is our data set. We're going to look to see can we find in a database of many strangers, can we find individuals who are genetically similar to a query individual? And, and, the, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to take everybody, put them in our similarity search database. We're going to have pick one person from one population as the query. 
we're going to get their uh, most similar, uh, you know, their nearest neighbors, given the algorithm I just talked about. And we're going to look at what I call the decay plot. So we're going to look at the of this cohort as we move from cohort size one, who's going to be the most similar individual, all the way down. We actually have cohort size 20, but that's a lot of dots. So cohort size one, what percentage of cohort size one is in your population? So here, that would be 100%. And then we, we, we go down. We, we move further away from our query individual. So we keep going down, down, and we hit our first person who's not in our, in our subpopulation. So the, the percent goes down. And we do that across the entire cohort. And I get what I call a decay plot. Make sense? And we do this for both superpopulation. So how many, what percent of the individuals are in your superpopulation? That is, for example, all of Africa, uh, or just in your subpopulation, you know, for Europeans, something like, like the Finnish individuals. Okay. And we get a result like this, and we compare that to this King robust coefficient is probably the most widely used genetic similarity search. It suffers from this pairwise problem I talked about. So it's not an effective uh, instrument for what we're trying to produce, but it does a good job at measuring similarity. And you can see here, we're looking at our, our projects called Genesis. So those are the straight lines, King robust are the dashed lines, okay? And if you are in the same superpopulation, you're gray, and, and the decay plot for subpopulations is blue. So you can see very, very similar results. Our, our results and, and King robust at the superpopulation level, our cohorts are 100% within the superpopulation. And the subpopulation, it decays down to, at the farthest end, about 75% of the people in our cohorts are in the same subpopulation. So for example, if we have a, a Finnish individual, you know, for every Finnish individual, all of the results will all be from Europeans. And about 75% 75, 75 of the cohorts will be from other people uh, from Finland. Make sense, the decay plots? Okay, and then, so let's look at this more broadly across all the populations. And uh, there's a bar up there, but these are three different measures of genetic similarity. King robust is this one here. And I actually showed, my, my example was the worst case for us, the one we're performing just as well as everybody else. But in all other cases, across all populations, Genesis actually outperforms uh, in these decay plots out to, outperforms at the superpopulation and subpopulation level, um, the, the formation of cohorts that represent the patient. That's the objective the whole time. We want to be, dynamically identify a set of individuals and we want the, that cohort, we want the query individual to be well represented at least genetically by that cohort. Um, so it looks like we're doing quite well. Uh, but the question remains is, so as the line dips down, well, where are these people coming from? Uh, so that's what, that's what we tried to capture here. So we have the query population along the, the vertical axis, and we have the cohort population across uh, the horizontal axis. So you think of it here. So each of these dots uh, tell you what the average number of people, if I query African-Americans, or, or sorry, I don't, I don't know, LWK, I forget what that one is. That's the query. And so 100% of, of those query individuals match the subpopulation there. And the density or the, the, the darkness of these squares indicate the uh, the average number of individuals from that subpopulation. And so this is our result genesis and you see King Robust. Uh, pretty similar. Um, what One interesting thing here is we're actually recovering known genetics. So you see the very top line is African-Americans. Uh, and we actually have the two top uh, subpopulations that we find are both from Nigeria, uh, which actually uh, is uh, supported in our understanding of the genetic effects of the transatlantic slave trade. And particularly if you zoom in here, most of the uh, slave trade that ended up in the United States started in Nigeria. So the genetics of African-Americans are heavily slanted towards uh, being similar to those from Nigeria. Um, all right, so this is all kind of like semi-quantitative, right? We're saying we have a query from a group and the cohorts are also largely from that group. But we'd like to have a, a little bit better way of, of quantifying that. And so what we did here is we used uh, this measure called the fixation index, FST. And it looks at the ratio of the variation within populations and then between populations. So it ends up being zero means the populations are identical and one means they are completely different. Uh, and, and, and we can kind of compare our results here to the same, looking at those same populations, how and this is for individuals and queries. This is for populations as a whole. So I take the entire population and I compare it to another entire population. I can estimate the similarity of those. And you can see that by and large, we capture 
um, the similarity um, from FST. We've calculated that for the percent of cohort with that most on FST. So we see this curve here and we do about as well as uh, King Robust overall. It's really hard to see, but in the most similar searches, we actually outperform King Robust. Um, they do a little bit better as we move further away. Uh, but overall, I think that we have a very well calibrated um, model for taking a query individual and finding their nearest neighbor among thousands or potentially millions of people in our database. All right, so it's pretty exciting, right? So let's just go do clinical trials. But I think anytime you're dealing, we're trying to address inequities. And so we must always be retrospective and look back at our own work and say, are we creating any inequities? And I'm defining this really broadly as, does our overall system have differential effects for one population versus another population? And I think there's kind of two ways of looking at this. First, I call it database inequities. And this is, you know, if I don't have anybody in my database that looks like my patient, I, I can't help but give you underrepresented cohorts. So, you know, we've been looking at this type of search. And this type of search is quite artificial. Oops because it's it's sourced from a project that was specifically trying to have a very genetically uh, diverse group of people. But if we look at our, our you know, who are in our biobanks, this is the uh, statistics for the Anschutz biobanks, we see we have almost exclusively uh, white people in our, in our group. So actually what the query looks like is depending on who you are, it might look like this, or it might look like, you know, you might have nobody that looks like you or, or everybody might look just like you. And we really want to understand there's not much that we can do about this from our perspective. These biobanks are regional. It's just the patients that happen to come in. So they largely reflect the regional uh, diversity of, in this case, um, Denver and, and Northern Colorado. Um, but we will at least want to know if we do a query, is that query, like are the results useful or not? So do you move forward with changing your diagnosis on a cohort that doesn't represent your query individual? So we. We, we're, we're just starting to kind of understand this, but we set up a series of experiments where we looked at subsets. Instead of looking at the entire database, we looked, we created ancestry specific databases. So I have my little picture up here to kind of give you a sense. So I have along this uh, top line, I have just an African database. And then I, I searched just African individuals. And then the next one is just American individuals, East Asian, European, and South Asian. And the next line is just American database with the same queries. Right, so, so this will kind of estimate that, you know, the effect of having a perfectly matched database and having a worst case scenario matched database. And we look at here is what is the genesis score distribution for those results? And you can kind of see for, for many of these populations, there is this pretty big cutoff where we could probably ignore any individual with a score below, you know, 1750. But that actually doesn't work for Africans. Africans are way more diverse than any population. This is a pop quiz. Does anybody know why Africans are more diverse? Yeah, yeah. So, so there is like there's several waves out of Africa. Those individuals took their genetics, went on, and then bottlenecked, and they they went forward just with that subset of the diversity. Whereas Africa continued with their diversity. It's actually one of the strongest pieces of evidence that. That, that we started as, as a species in Africa is the, is the diversity differences between Africans and everybody else. But so for, since Africans are more diverse, they have different distributions. And so whatever quality score we come up with can't be this hard threshold. It must really understand what are the underlying diversity of the query individual in the database and come up with some way, because there are still good overlaps, or, or I mean, if we had this hard cutoff, you'd still have good overlaps for American individuals um, searching within uh, an African database. So this is still early work, uh, but we at least want to understand, you know, very basically is is what score is good enough and what score is not good enough for reporting um, these these uh, representative cohorts. Uh, so that's database inequities. The other is a model inequity. Did we do something fundamental either in our model construction or in our training that would create an inequity? And so I'll remind you what we did here is we took we took an individual's variance as the input to our training and we came up with a uh a embedding on the on the on the uh on the end of that and i want to point out one observation is i said africans are much more diverse than any other population well that results in them having significantly more 
genetic variants than anybody else. So that's what this plot here is. You have all of these Europeans, East Asians, and then over here you have Africans. And the y-axis here is the variance uh, per genome by millions. So they have 0.2 million more on average variants than anybody else. So, okay, well, I have this, these vectors. So I'm going to have the African vectors are going to be much more dense and have much more information than, for example, the Finnish vectors, right? And so, but I, so I start off with a variable density uh, input and I end up with a fixed length embedding on the end. So is this density creating a problem for me? Am I, am I having a problem? I'm trying to compress a lot more information into a fixed vector. Am I losing some power? And in fact, you know, in our data, we see this, we see Africans are more dense on average than anybody else. And in fact, we do. So this, this bottom plot is the correlation of an individual's um, distance at, at, at this level versus their distance at that level. And you can see that there's a clear bias in having a poor correlation for people with high density vectors. So this is a, a major problem for us. We don't actually see Africans performing any worse in, at a high level, but certainly at this level, we, we do have some deficiencies and we have some ideas to either add some normalization or to specifically sample higher density vectors in our training. We didn't, we didn't know this was gonna happen. We were just going back and looking for inequities and we found this. So when we're gonna do, when we're gonna retrain, we're gonna specifically select uh, vectors at, at, at different levels of density to try to try to get these dots back up here. All right, so we have a model. Uh, I think that you can agree that it's it's pretty well trained. It can find representative individuals. We do have some inequity problems, some that we can't really control, which which corresponds to how diverse the database is, and some that we can control uh, with respect to what our model and training um, training does. Um, but you know, how well does it work in a real scenario? So as I said. The, uh, at Anschutz, they have a biobank with, with uh, nearly half a million people. They've sequenced almost 100,000 of them. So we tested our methods with 70, uh, you know, nearly yeah, 73,000 individuals from that biobank. And actually had pretty results. So surprisingly, an individual query takes on average 0.15 seconds to respond. So that's quick enough so that you can imagine a doctor hitting a button and in less than a second, we can identify what uh, the most related individuals are in this biobank. And then unless the clinical analysis takes a long time, which hopefully it won't, we can potentially have this real-time system that doctors can use. How does it perform? So this, this is the same kind of plot we saw before, uh, but there, we don't have subpopulation information. We just have superpopulation information. And for uh, four of the six superpopulations, we're performing very well. We perform very poorly for Middle Eastern-like individuals and South Asian-like individuals. And we don't know why this is. One is, if you remember the 1,000 Genomes plot, there is no Middle Eastern sampling whatsoever. We trained on that, so that could be a big gap. There's also very few Middle Eastern individuals in this population. There's like 200, where there's several thousand for the rest of the populations. But we do know that at least the genesis score for these populations would give us an indication that we would perform, perform poorly for these two populations. So while we don't really haven't nailed the quality score, it can at least kind of give us a sense of what populations would more likely or be less likely to return interesting results. All right, so at this point we have a system, it works for large scale biobanks. Now what, oh, well, we're going for it, right? ARPA-H is a newish uh, US government agency, funding agency that put out a call for crazy ideas. We said, we've got a crazy idea. We wanna totally revamp the way doctors get their data and treat their patients. We don't want to rely just on static clinical trials. We want to do dynamic clinical trials from biobanks. So I led a group uh, with three other co-PIs from Anschutz and just a whole mess of people. Uh, Ellen, was that, I'm trying, trying to see Aaron, uh, and several other people from our department were also part of this. We partnered with UCLA. One of the really cool things that we could possibly do, I said, database inequities are not something we can do about. But actually, yeah, we can. We can use federated learning to include other biobanks that might cover some of our, you know, if you see they might have more Hispanic individuals, for example. Uh, and if we if we partner with Mount Sinai, they will have many more Jamaican individuals. So the more biobanks that we have, we can increase the, uh, the the diversity of the pool that we can draw our dynamic cohorts from. And also, as I said, Intel did a lot of early funding for this. So we amassed a really big group of individuals and we just, we submitted this grant and they can kind of describe it quickly. So the, uh, or, yeah, or am, I, am I good on time? Okay. So the, the existing infrastructure is you go to the doctor, 
and your, at least in UC Health, your data is going to be stored in Epic. Some set of the people that went to doctor agreed to be in our biobank. There's about 200,000. That's always increasing. And so for right now, uh, the, the center, the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine maintains this biobank. They have both the this data warehouse with snapshots of the Epic um, uh, medical records and they have the patient genetics. So this is the existing infrastructure. So what we'd like to do is we would like to basically train the model I just talked about on all of these patients. We're going to do some pre-staging of, of the clinical trial uh, or the, the electronic health record data. So, so that processing isn't very slow. And what we'd like to have is you come into a patient, the, the patient comes in, the doctor uh, clicks the button, that goes out, I dynamically identifies the, the, the uh, similar cohort. We then redo the clinical math and that result gets delivered back to the doctor. They look at that and they, we added this, this feedback function where they can say, oh, this is a really good result or actually my patient's poorly, uh, poorly represented in your system, so, so please throw it away. And we can use that to update our training and have better and better, uh, rep more and more representative cohorts. And we're gonna take this entire system and we're proposing to do a phase two distri uh, distributed trial for something like hypertension or type two diabetes, something that's pretty common, has major health disparities and the outcomes are, are pretty quick, you know, glucose levels or, or blood pressure levels. So yeah, our whole idea is to actually deploy, to build and deploy this system in the five states that, that UC Health is across and, and several hundred clinics we really want to push this out to primary care providers so we can actually start to see some of the benefits of personalized medicine. Right now, personalized medicine is super expensive. Gene therapies are like millions of dollars. But if we can get this type of system out to primary care uh, providers, they can start to give people the medication, the dosages they need earlier on and not go through the pain and all the expense of, of modifying those, those dosages until something actually works. Um, we have a second phase of this where we'd like to actually integrate uh, using some um, federated learning techniques to integrate UCLA. So searches can go across uh, CU's biobank and UCLA's biobank all without sharing any patient level data, which is really important. Uh, they say that it's patient privacy. They're actually interested in how valuable all of this data is to pharmaceutical companies. So without really spilling any IP across uh, institutes. And then we actually want to start addressing this idea that genetics might not be the most important piece of data when assembling a cohort for you for the disease that you have. So we're going to look at other biomarkers like methylation. It turns out looking at your retina is a really powerful diagnostic technique. You can see it, one, which is nice. And also it's like blood vessels. And so you can, you can diagnose hypertension and diabetes and all sorts of other diseases just from the retina. Uh, and then we also like to include... Um, EHR data, so it can kind of give ideas of health status. Um, and essentially, we would create new embeddings given the same overall structure with you, when you have the, um, the same learning um, style that we use, the Siamese learning networks, and create embeddings for all of these different data types, and then include those in kind of a, a meta uh, search where we have different weights for different diseases, and we will pick different cohorts based on on what the, not just the patient's genetics, but what their current state is and what the doctor needs. Um, yeah, so so we submitted that. Hopefully, hopefully, I still haven't heard back. It's been like six months. Uh, so I guess no news is better than a no. Uh, so we'll see, but it, regardless, we're going to pursue how can we actually take this similarity search and deploy it in a clinical setting to improve um, representation and, and start to address some of those inequities where large groups of people in our country, and especially those who are most at risk, can't benefit from some of our clinical trials. All right, so that's the biggest project we have going on right now. We actually have a lot of stuff going on in the lab. Uh, we look at structural variation, which is a specific type of rearrangement in your, uh, in your genome. Actually partnering with Ellen, we're actually looking at sonifying some of that to, you know, when, if, I, if I look for how many structural variants you have in your, in your genome, I'm gonna come back with about 300,000. Uh, almost all of those are false positives. Some of them do nothing. One of them might be disease causing. That's a lot of data to, to turn through. And we have these really coarse filters. Uh, we're thinking, Ellen and I are thinking of ways of really not just looking at visual spectrum, but also audio spectrum. How can you increase your bandwidth where you can manually curate many more of these things? Uh, we're also very interested in, in the genetics of wildlife. Uh, we focus so much on humans and human genetics, but, but if we're going to do effective conservation in the future, especially as the climate changes, we're gonna really need to understand the population genetics of all sorts of different animal species so we can make the right conservation decisions. 
Uh, we're doing large scale DNA sequence searches for pandemic preparedness and also have some projects related to autoimmune disorders. All of these are heavily collaborative uh, uh, efforts, many with Anschutz other, and, and internationally with other, other groups. All right, any questions? These are my, my five boys. Question about like the reruns here on the clinical trial on the cohort that you assembled from the genetic similarities. So how do we really like run those trials without you know or testing whatever medication you really want to so that can get the genetic cohort? So the so the um our data sets probably aren't big enough yet, but we should, you know, they five years ago this this biobank had zero people in it. Now it has nearly half a million. What you know, who knows what it'll be in five years. So we want to have the solutions in place to meet the data when we have it. And so ideally, you would have a large enough group of people that looked like you that had your disorder and tried a variation of medications. And and we would do some um, inference to say, you know, what you could just do is is deliver the doctor a visualization of here are the different tranches of of treatments, and here is here are the outcomes, and they could just visualize them. We can also look for some more causal um, effects of how closely related was this specific treatment and this specific dosage to health. So it would require those individuals have already had those treatments and those diseases. Yeah, which is going to be a big, a big data set. Um, are there differential privacy concerns when it comes to uh, like assembling these cohorts and giving out outcomes related to Yeah, no, that's a good question. The nice thing is we are doing it at a summary level. We're not saying that Ryan did great with 7.5. We are saying that on average, people that were similar to you and like the and the similarity would be summarized as well, you know, like smoking status or BMI or age or, or whatever, whatever attributes are really important to that specific disease. You would see that we would we would give you a summary of the cohorts status at that. And then we would give summaries of, of how different treatments responded to those. So it's all all at a very summarized level. Follow up, like if, if you have a sufficiently underrepresented group, yeah, like a, a sufficiently uh, tight set of conditions that you, you need to need to build this cohort, um, could you run into problems where you're like spitting out the info? From yeah, this is not going to help on rare disease, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. But I think you know, so in, in this case, when you're looking at possible attacks, you have to look at the attackers, right? Yeah. And so, we're not proposing that we allow unfettered access to query this database, it would be within a medically approved, a HIPAA approved device that the physician would have. So the, it would be, you know, they already have access to all of Epic from those, from those interfaces. And actually Epic is probably one of our, Epic is, is the biggest uh, provider of electronic health record um, informatics, but they are also doing something similar. So the level of access that those individuals have is already high. And I don't think we're increasing any attacks, but that's a really good question. No, I don't. I only take questions from a lot of people. No. The first one is based on the last points. Are you collaborating with the vet school at CSU or elsewhere? We are not yet collaborating with this the vet school. I don't. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a would be a really good uh, resource to look at. We're by weird by weird happenstance, we have some like FDA collaborators and and many European collaborators, but we haven't reached out to anybody at the vet school. So I think digital twins are incredibly problematic, right? So so imagine this idea that you're going to how do you how do you take uh, an individual and slightly slightly skewed? I think this is a digital, digital twin. Is they can tell, tell me if I'm wrong? Is you 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 digitally create someone that looks just like you. And then are you gonna digitally create how they responded to particular men? I think that, that the human system is too complex to rely on synthetic individuals. I think that we need to follow the path that clinical trials have worked really well. We, 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 we all, I don't know, hopefully we all got COVID shots. Uh, you know, we've, we've benefited dramatically from the way that trials have been done. Unfortunately, they've left many people behind. So I think one of the nice things about what we're talking about doing, it, it's not outside normal workflows, right? We always, we go back, we do meta, analysis, we do retrospective clinical trials all the time. And all we're saying is we want to be more specific and more intentional about who we include in that group. 
And so that the average of that group reflects the, uh, you know, reflects the patient who we're trying to inform. So I think it's, it's in step with all of these ways in which we think that we should attain clinical data. Uh, the ideas of doing digital twins, I think, is 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 a little bit uh, terrifying to me. Yeah. So, I mean, what about rather than having a binary classification, more quantitative? For example, here you are classified, say, okay, that person is on is more similar to that people. So what if you say, okay, some probability, let's say 7% you are close to that goal, but when you're 30%, you can't belong to any other goal, right? So, and then can, are you able to use those? Uh, the... You're talking about in, 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 if we have this, we have an existing trial and like the first graph I said, you can't just draw these, these lines. You're saying, what if we make it more fuzzy? Yeah, I mean, I think you'll end up with having a similar problem with, you know, so, okay, how do you draw the fuzzy line? Okay, let's find the nearest neighbors. That's kind of what we've done. So I think we're, we're talking about, about including people not based on predefined groups. I mean, there's a lot of problems in these predefined groups to begin with, right? Um, you know, what about what about someone who's of mixed ancestry? Like, where the hell do they land on this? So I think I think that's a big problem as well. But I think what you're getting at is is in these in these cohorts, ancestry is not enough. You'll have overlaps. I want to pick some from this group and pick from that group. Well, I think the logical endpoint of that is a totally dynamic system. That doesn't define doesn't depend on groups that's kind of where we're going but i think you know i think that you could potentially have you know like some system where you have a weighted sum among different groups but again i think you run into problems about mixed ancestry or you know in this case like you know middle eastern is not even represented at all in this so like what do you do with those individuals is your assumption so now your, your main assumption is but i do know the similarity to the cohorts but i see the problem is not Solved, yes, right? The cohort's totally dynamic, right? So, so that, that how, how much like the prescribing the medication, the dosage, does that that still is not accurate, right? I mean, you know what I mean? I mean I, well, I, I can I can kind of riff off of what you're saying. So I think I don't know if what you're saying is like we're relying on those patients to have been treated effectively, right? Yes. And and they have been they have been heretofore treated less than optimally because they started at five milligrams so they needed 7.5. I think it will require a bunch of people who had good outcomes in the data set. I think that's a requirement. So if you have if you have the genetics, you have a bunch of people with good outcomes and you have and they overlap your needs, then I think that it, it will uh, be effective. But I think and I think there's also you know a, another thing, another inequity would be the fact that underrepresented individuals in this population would be treated way suboptimally. And so you're going to you're going to propagate these, these these poor treatments too. So that's yeah another potential inequity. Those are yeah those are there's some major problems. I'm not saying we're going to fix everything with this system. I think that we actually could probably identify some of those inequities uh, with this type of system. But um but yeah I think I think it's a super complicated problem. Your cohorts are just a bunch of genetic similarity. Yep. Right? Yeah. So but I could also wait no it's pairwise it's it's a I mean it's it's a it's a nearest neighbor search. So so every individual is not pre grouped. Right. Uh, everyone else has everyone in there to begin with has just as good a chance as being your cohort as anybody else, uh, but for the similarity search algorithm. I, would you ever make that a function of treatment outcomes? Because I could imagine that your cohort might look different as a function of a specific medication yeah. with variance around treatment outcomes given that. A hundred percent. Another feature space and another math to sort of and maybe get a more fuzzy outcome. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly, you're exactly right. So genetic genetics is important for some diseases. Environment is important for some diseases. And we're not representing the environment whatsoever. But I think in the future, we want to start with genetics because at least that's stable, right? Your genetics don't change over time, but your environment is going to change over time. You know, there's all these questions. Well, what is the assay to acquire your environment? Like, you know, what is, how close are you to a highway? What, you know, what is the pollution like in your neighborhood? Those, those aren't readily available data, but we do have an overall system that can combine, you know, if we can find, form embeddings for those, we can find similarity at that level and similarity at the genetic level, and then probably do this kind of fuzzy, uh, you know, weighted um, sum of those different similarities that will be dependent on individual um, disorders. So I think, I think what we're originally gonna do is, is you'll have to stamp out a version of this to some extent for, for there'll be one for hypertension, one for type two diabetes, one for autism, you know, whatever it is, 
you're going to, there's going to be specifics for each uh, for each um, condition that we need to represent in our in our similarity search. Okay, let's take Ryan. <laughs> All right. Thank you all.